This is the sinker, Polly. It was always a spring ritual when we were kids. <laughs> My brother Paul and I could hardly wait to dig out our baseball mitts after a cold Canadian winter and do a little spring training. It was just one of the many things that we as brothers did together growing up in a really Ontario. Our parents were always very supportive and loving with all our endeavors. Being the older one, I was the brother of firsts, the first to play organized sports, first one to high school, that sort of thing. But little brother Paul was always right behind me. After we finished high school, Paul and I took off in different directions. He ended up working for the LCBO, from which he has recently retired. He was the first one of us to get married, which unfortunately ended. He has since remarried and has been with Sherry for the last 33 years. My brother and his wife have three wonderful children. Paul is truly a family man, loves his children, loves his wife, loves his life. I am very proud of my younger brother. My brother Paul is also an alcoholic. I lived in such a fog, in a dark, dark place that I thought I'd never, ever get out of. When they say to me, well, why don't you just quit gambling? Well, you think if I could, I would? I am an alcoholic, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I think probably in my early 30s, I, I crossed the line. Uh, drinking became a, uh, a regular habit. It was an everyday thing. It wasn't anymore just a weekend, have fun with my, the buddies type thing. Came home from work, first thing I did, pour a drink. Before I even said hello to the wife and kids. But I would drink a 26 or a whiskey uh, before I went to bed at night. There were always the I don't want to go and do that because we can't drink there. Um, those sorts of things that went on. It's hard to believe they're all that young one time. Mustache and mullet. Yeah. <laughs> I always went to work on time, always did my job correctly, never took a drink at work. At work, I never touched alcohol. Paul was a functioning alcoholic. Uh, most people think of alcoholics as the people that have lost their homes, lost their jobs, lost their family lost everything in the world because of alcohol. Paul didn't lose everything, but it was a close call on occasions. <laughs> I have a nice home, wife, children, good two-car garage. What more could I ask for? How can I be an alcoholic? Because addiction has such a stigma, no one would choose to be an addict or an alcoholic or have a substance use disorder. So coming to terms with having that issue in your life is very difficult. Nobody wants it. So it's, there's a, a fairly long process, and some would call it denial, and some would just call it an early stage of recovery, of coming to terms with whether or not I have a problem. Peg and Jerry live together. They are both recovering alcoholics and are both members of Alcoholics Anonymous. Rock bottom for Jerry came when he was put in a penitentiary at the height of his alcohol abuse. At the very end, I came to in a jail cell that uh, uh, I had woke up in before and, and I knew that I wasn't going to get released and, and that I was on my way to the penitentiary. And, and uh, my, my last drunk was a three-day drunk and it cost me three years in the penitentiary. I think it may have been manageable and it was manageable for a long time until when it changed was when I made alcohol my solution. Alcohol was a means to try and keep everything together and you know living like that for many years I finally crossed the line where I went from having a drink because it was something that I wanted to do to having a drink because I needed to. Seven years ago we uh, our youngest daughter Kara um, was diagnosed with leukemia um, she ended up going to Princess Margaret Hospital and uh, spent an awful lot of time there as well as we did. Had a bone marrow transplant and the thought of ever losing a child killed me. I mean, it was the scariest thing that's ever happened in my life. I, um, I drank, started, oh, I drank even worse than I ever did. I mean, I can remember taking a Mickey into her hospital room and actually sneaking into the bathroom and having a drink while I was sitting with her. 
And boy, oh boy, I, I think of that and I think, you know, what kind of a dad can, am I to do that? Totally fell into the bottle and couldn't get back up after our daughter passed away seven years ago. After Tara's death, I uh, also ended up in the hospital. And um, of course, my wife was by my side, and uh, I was close to death. They told my wife that I may not make it through the night. Uh, that's how bad the alcohol was in me. My pancreas was ready to explode. Everything was going uh, crazy in there. Once I went through the, with the withdrawal system, or the withdrawals in the hospital, I knew that the drinking had to end. The doctors told me that, my wife told me that. Without Sherry by my side, I would never have taken that first step. We have the disease, just it's no different than diabetes or the cancer or any other disease. It's the only difference with ours is that uh, we can't have recovery. We find that through, uh, through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not about willpower, it's not about making any kind of a choice. People who are addicted have a disease. Bob Priest is an avid golfer, loves to play around with his buddies and share a few laughs. Typically, golfers like to test their golf prowess by making a few side bets or wages with their opponents as they battle it out on the fairways and greens, but not Bob Priest. For him, all bets are off. I was on a trip to uh, the Barbados with the company I was working for at the time, and we stayed right across the street from the casino, and I kind of figured at that time if I went over to the casino then I would buy my wife something for every fifty dollars I lost and you know by the time I got home she had six nice little gifts so I think that's when it started for me but in all honesty it really got going when the casino opened at Rama in 1996. It totally takes over your life. The the physical part of gambling being at the casino is nothing compared to the time that you only think about it, which is the other 24 hours a day that you're not gambling. It takes over your social life, your family life, uh, because all you're doing is thinking about gambling. As far as the, the, the biochemistry of it or the, the physiology of it, addiction is addiction is addiction. So what happens in the person's brain when they begin to move towards an addiction is the same whether it's gambling or sex or alcohol or drugs. All addictions have certain characteristics but gambling you know your next door neighbor could be a gambler your wife could be a gambler you just don't know who there's no physical signs of it it can't be cured and that is the biggest thing about any addiction is getting used to the idea that it cannot be cured. I think one of the reasons that food addiction has a low profile is that food isn't seen as a drug. Food is seen as a necessity of life. So how can you be addicted to food? And that's the dilemma for both Kate and Maria when it comes to raising awareness about their misunderstood addiction. Compulsive overeaters are using food as a drug. Sometimes it is an actual addictive quality, like some people with sugar, they can't stop eating it once they start, even when they feel sick. But for other people, it's just using food in inappropriate ways as a coping strategy. And I think it's really important for people to understand that it is possible to use food addictively and that there's help out there, just as there is for other drugs. An alcoholic, a gambler, um, someone who uses drugs, they know what their demon is. So they go in and they slay the dragon. As a food addict, you can't stop eating. So three times a day we go in and we pet that dragon. An alcoholic can drink. They can drink juice, they can drink milk, they can, they can drink lots of things. They know it's alcohol that they have to stay away from. I can eat too, there's nothing wrong with food. Food is nourishing. 
for me personally, I cannot touch sugar, I cannot touch wheat, I cannot touch flour, and I, I cannot touch high fat foods. I have to stay away from those things. I think that's one of the reasons why there are so few people who understand that it's possible to recover from food addiction because you have to use your drug moderately every day. For Kate and Maria, that path to recovery is due to an organization called Overeaters Anonymous. I don't feel that gaping raw wound inside anymore. As a member of Overeaters Anonymous, I have a support group bar none. I, I can't imagine my life anymore without OA. It's, it's given me a life. It's given me a reason. <laughs> she was a northern girl. He was a city boy. Crystal Moore and Ryan Byers may have come from very different backgrounds, but they have two things in common, a beautiful baby girl and a long history of drug abuse. <laughs> After a while, like, you just start thinking what you're doing is not wrong anymore because you're so used to it. It's part of the lifestyle, doing the crime, doing the drugs. It's just now that I'm clean, I'm basically um, paying for a lot of mistakes, and that's where a lot of people have a problem with relapsing is dealing with all the mistakes and problems you created for yourself when you're a drug addict. I'm trying to make up for all those things that I've done, you know, from selling myself to taking from good-hearted people that were really just trying to help what they thought I was standing for, and I wasn't. Um, all I was standing for was for my addiction. Crystal and Ryan have been together now for 11 years. Six years ago, they had their first child. While they were both using, things did not work out. It was decided uh, through the Children's Aid Society that um, we would be undergoing a uh, kinder care agreement for my daughter, for our daughter, and that my parents would be taking her, uh, thankfully. Otherwise, she'd probably be in foster care right now because I just was not fit to be a mother. We weren't capable of, of even looking after ourselves at the time, to be honest with you. We tried, but we'd always fall back into the trap, plus everybody we'd know, like we were hanging out with, we were using. So it was really hard to get out of that lifestyle. And taking care of a child was definitely something we couldn't do at the time. We need to acknowledge that they realized that they couldn't care for their first child. So they came up with a plan, which included the paternal grandmother, and grandfather. And then they had a second child. I was heavily into my addiction then, just as much as I was the first time I had a child. Um, nothing changed throughout the whole pregnancy, you know. I, I, I did curtail my drug use and uh, I stopped escorting. I was still not fit to be a mother during that time while I was carrying this child. Once she was born, something happened. I fell in love with her. And I know that may seem callous, that, and it may seem like, you know, why didn't that happen with the first child? But it, it, I don't know, I don't know why it happened this time. I don't know why. You know, sometimes the unremarkable just turns into remarkable, right? And that's really this case. There is really nothing complicated other than that this was their time. They're our dream team. Our daughter changed our life irrevocably and um, our lives quite honestly have not been the same since and for the better our lives have not been this amazing um, and this blessed uh, ever <laughs> behind me is one of three methadone clinics located within the city of Barrie now there are a lot of myths and misunderstandings regarding the methadone program including a stereotype attached to the people that use them People think it's the people that are ha hanging out at Centennial Park. Uh, it is not. That is probably, street people are probably less than 10% of the people that come into this clinic. It is teachers, uh, it's dentists, it's lawyers, it's uh, working people, uh, construction guys, everything. There is no, it's female, male, young, old. There, you, you could not say that there's some form of society that is more likely to be addicted than, than the rest. Siobhan Hagen utilizes one of two methadone clinics in Aurelia. She became addicted to over-the-counter painkillers after having a C-section. She's been on the program for 12 years. 
I didn't think I'd be still be on it. I thought I'd be done with it by now. But there's people that are on it for life. And you might be one of them. I very well could be. Methadone is taken by patients on a daily basis. It is not injected. It starts off as a powder, is formed into a syrup, and usually mixed with orange juice. Methadone program is a program for people who suffer from opiate addiction, who can't stop using opiates any other way. And methadone is actually a long-acting opiate that will stop people's cravings and withdrawal symptoms from drugs and allow them to function much, uh, in a much better way than they previously were doing. People on the program are required to see a doctor once a week, as well as take a mandatory urine test to monitor whether they are clear of drugs. You have to build a trust, so uh, the, the reward for being clean is that you don't have to come to the drugstore and have your drink every day. You um, can take it home, it's called a carry. I got diagnosed in, 19, or in 2002 with fibromyalgia. The doctors put me on Oxycontins. I spent 11 years hooked on them. I gained a whole bunch of weight. And then two years ago, I heard about the methadone clinic. I met Dr. Koifman and Barry. He's a miracle worker. Since I've been on the methadone program, I've been clean off of all other drugs. And my whole life has just done a 360. I'm, I'm on the path to new, bigger, better things now. So I'm just over the moon. <laughs> It's actually helpful to have a methadone clinic in a community because patients have, a, have access to treatment. And when they have access to treatment, they're, they're healthy, there's less criminal activity. Um, it's better for the community as a whole. We're not trading one drug for another. For the most part, 90% of patients are here because they want to get off drugs and get their life back in order. And it really does help. It really does. You think it might have saved your life? Absolutely. Crystal and Ryan have been on the methadone program for over 10 years, despite the fact they were still using other drugs until the birth of their second child. Cocaine's a different class of drugs, so if someone uses cocaine, they can still get high. By the same token, if they use a benzodiazepine or a sleeping medication, they can still get high. For right now, for Crystal and Ryan's sake, that child's completely normal, uh, from what I can see, and every time they, they bring the child in with them, and. Uh, I would say that child's a pretty normal looking child, behavior-wise and uh, everything. So those, those two are <laughs> two very lucky people. You can take methadone if you're pregnant. It's riskier to the baby and the mother if we taper them off methadone because there's a risk of relapse and that's affiliated with a whole uh, assortment of risks to the uh, child. With the, the other drug use, uh, that child uh, will have an increased risk of uh, you know, autistic spectrum disorder, uh, ADHD, some mental illness, there's a higher risk of it because of the, uh, of the drug use that was going on in there. Ready? Ready, I'm set. When you're pregnant and you're using, like, you know, I, I can't imagine any woman not feeling guilt and remorse. We call her our little angel because quite honestly, at this point, you know, we're very, very lucky and I know other people that haven't been this lucky. Jim's first problem with substance abuse began with alcohol at a very early age. However, an experience that most of us have had led him on a path to full-blown drug addiction. It started with a trip to the dentist to have my wisdom teeth uh, pulled out. Um, I was prescribed Percocet and that's where I got the initial taste. I think that at a certain point in time, doctors were more freely handing out prescriptions for pain medication, especially with the, um, the OxyContin. Oxy was, uh, it was kind of like the, uh, the problem solver. Well, you know, we have low doses, we have high doses, and it was kind of, doctors were, because at one point it was everywhere. In retrospect, there's a lot of debate whether the pharmaceutical companies knew it or not. Um, at the first, they probably did not know. Um, but that drug, uh, it was an easy fix from someone taking multiple pills a day for short acting to the long acting. Uh, but no one, uh, physician or the patients at the time, really understood uh, the high addiction problem with that medication. It seemed like so many people were having it prescribed to them and then it just, you know, leaked down to, you know, the recreational users and that's what's caused the problems now. We know that there's certain subtype of people that you shouldn't even introduce to any kind of narcotic. 
Uh, they're such a high risk, and uh, and it became a default medication. There was a time where all of a sudden you got surgery, or you went to emerge, or you went anywhere, and we all wrote your prescription for Percocet, uh, and the long-acting medication was OxyContin. It just became the default medication, and uh, uh, and here we are now. Nowadays, because of you know methadone clinics are opening up in rural towns, and um, you know more and more people are going on these programs, I think doctors are like, well, maybe we should be a little bit more introduce other options for pain management instead of just saying, well, here's a hundred of these pain pills. Maybe it's not affecting the people who are legitimately taking the pills, but they're being subverted to the black market somehow. People cannot understand how it totally takes over your life. When they say to me, well, why don't you just quit gambling? Well, do you think if I could, I would? No one is enjoying being an addict or an alcoholic. Uh, by the time they qualify, or if I can put it that way, for that diagnosis, their lives are miserable. And most of them, by the time they come to see me or they present for treatment, they have tried to quit many, many, many times. So it's not as simple as, why don't you just quit? That is a callous um, characterization of addiction. I've learned to use the analogy of diabetics. With diabetes, how much sense does it make to say to someone, well, you should be able to think yourself into having a healthy pancreas. If you were stronger, you could get over this by yourself. You shouldn't need to take insulin every day. I like to think that addiction is exactly the same as that. If I could have thought myself well, I would have done it long ago. People have their, their judgments, and it's tough for me because I think they're looking down at me and they're judging me, and part of me wants to lash out, and I know that that's not going to help. I can remember times coming back from Rama when I was right near the bottom of my rung, thinking, you know, that bridge embutment looks pretty nice. You know, I could just veer off the road and, and hit that embutment. But, you know, I don't think I, I have the guts to do that. Um, but yes, it certainly comes into mind. Yeah, and I think it probably does in any addiction. I would say an addiction can be defined by considering the uh, impact on the person's life. The people surrounding the person with the alcohol or the drug use disorder are significantly negatively affected by anyone in their family who has an addiction. And it can take years and years to rebuild the trust that's lost after the person enters recovery. Don Sheridan's life has been one of violence, drugs, and alcohol, cut off from even family members. Things could not have been worse. I told her that as long as she was using, she couldn't have be anywhere around the kids. Um, I wanted proof of like 90 days clean and sober to show me she wasn't allowed. It was she couldn't come around. I had nothing left inside of me anymore. To it was I was just like hollow inside. I. Uh, I couldn't see my ch grandchildren at all. I couldn't talk to my other children. And I really thought that she, this is how she was going to die. He's a good boy. He is a good boy. Dawn's life changed dramatically six months ago. She got clean. I'm just so grateful to have my daughter and my grandchildren back. It's the most important thing to me in my life. And now, in the past six months, we've been together. She's my best friend. Um, she's my s support system. She helps me out more than ever. I wouldn't be where I am today without her. <laughs> I lived in such a fog and a dark, dark place that I thought I'd never, ever get out of. I honestly feel like I'm just starting to live a life. Addiction is definitely a relapsing disease. It's, it's permanent. It's progressive. Um, it's chronic, and relapse is almost, unfortunately, a natural um, step along the way in recovery. You're always afraid because, like I said, it, it can happen so fast, but you just got to watch the environment around you. You just got to constantly tell yourself, you know, I'm not that person, that uh, the alcohol person. I'm, I'm sober, Paul, now. For me, there's two kinds of fear. There's good fear and bad fear. Good fear is, uh, you know, I'm almost 11 years, 
So the fear of going back is a good fear because I don't want to go back. So going into uh, you know a meeting or telling somebody that I relapsed after 11 years is a good fear. Um, bad fears are the ones where every time you walk into a Max Milk store or something, there's casinos, there's lotteries, there's roll up the rim. The temptation is always there, but you have to keep in the back of your mind, you just cannot do this. I know I have another bed in me, but I don't know if I have another recovery. For me, we are in recovery. We are not recovered, right. and, and, and that's the whole secret. Uh, we need to continually uh, remind ourselves that who we are and where we came from. I know that I am one bite away from 210 pounds every day because I'm, I'm always going to be a, a food addict. That's not going to change. Um, but for today, if I can do today the same thing I did yesterday, then I'll be blessed to be able to fit in the same size clothes, you know, for, for one more day. <laughs> <laughs> did you like that? It's <laughs> not uh, very common um, that two people can go f one day being full-blown drug addicts to the next day, never looking back. So uh, not that doesn't ever happen. Most people have slips. Most people um, uh, end up relapsing after the honeymoon period, um, but we haven't. Actually, I feel very satisfied for them, you know, uh, because they, they were two people that I thought for life would never give up their drugs. And I wouldn't have been surprised the day that I heard that they had died, one of them had died for both of them and for them to kind of make that change. For me, it just tells you never to give up on a patient. Oh, there's one. There's a beauty. I can't say how very, very, very proud I am of him for taking the steps and recovering. He's a better husband, he's a better father, and he's a better grandfather than he was when he drank. And what keeps me going is the fact that I know I know I'm going to see her someday. I don't know if it's in heaven. I don't know if it's across the street. I don't know where it is, but I am going to see her someday. That keeps me going. I, I, you know, I'm not afraid of dying anymore. I used to be all my life, oh, I don't want to, oh, you know, I thought of dying. Now, when it happens, and my time comes, it comes, and I, I'm just I'm so happy to see her. They kept saying at the end of every meeting, keep coming back. It works if you work it. And here I am almost four years later, 60, 70 pounds less than I was. To me, that's a miracle. I weigh what I weighed in grade eight. It's been almost 11 years, and I still have thoughts of going gambling. But I just know what it's going to do. This is the good fear. I just know what it's going to do if I go back. If that's the case, then I'll go to a meeting. I'll go to a 12-step program. That was fun. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> just like the old days. You can get better. It's my passion now to help other people out with this. And uh, I welcome anyone to come forward and see me anytime, any, anybody, anywhere I am, because I love to help people out now. And everybody can be helped. This is the true, raw reality of what addiction is like, you know. And the most positive thing that could happen is what has happened to my husband and I. It's the best thing could possibly happen for anybody. I, I just see them as really brave people. People with addictions who are trying to recover are people who deserve tremendous respect. It's an incredibly different, difficult choice for anyone to make in their life. It's the biggest change that most people will ever make in their lives. And so I think anyone who chooses recovery is deserving of enormous respect and support.